Our next panel is going to be led by Urza Roizen, also with a family connection to the Vader Enterprise. He was the VP of Business and Product Development at Aircraft Technology Partners. He started several companies. And we'd like to have a, pause, a moment of pause for this. He's an A's fan. He also was on the board of the Haas Business School and is an incredible moderator. So a big hand for this incredible moderator. There appear to be a um, there appear to be a never-ending uh, stream of uh, market inefficiencies that can be uh, uh, exploited and fixed and leveraged to create very impressive new businesses. And we have three uh, terrific entrepreneurs uh, coming up now to uh, to talk about their experiences building them. So this isn't about me; it's about them. So let's get Jordan uh, Jordan Messner from Washio. Come on up. We have Lynn Perkins, Urban Sitter. And Aaron from Dog Vacay, and 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 Dog Vacay uh, was also a uh, Vader Splash LA winner, um, which I have to believe was fundamentally instrumental to their success. Uh, the um, so uh, what I'd like to do first is just have each of them, and we have 20 minutes or so, so we'll keep it pretty pretty uh, pretty quick. If each of you could just go down and um, starting on the far end, just give a quick summary of your company and the and the, and the marketplace you're developing. Okay, Jordan down there. Hello? Jack? You're on. All right, I'll go like this. Is that better? I'm good now. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Jordan Metzner from Washio. We're on demand dry clean and laundry based here in Santa Monica, California. Hi, my name is Lynn Perkins. I'm the CEO of Urban Sitter. We help uh, child care providers and parents connect. We're based in San Francisco, but we're in about 60 cities nationwide. Uh, my, name's, <laughs> my name's Aaron. I'm the founder and top dog at Dog Vacay. We're a community marketplace for pet care. So we have 20,000 hosts across the US and Canada who will care for your dog like a member of their own family instead of leaving them in a kennel when you travel. Awesome. So we're going to start. I have a couple of, uh, I have three main lines of question. That, but, but, but the first one, and this is sort of the blocking and tackling question of marketplaces, uh, is obviously sort of the supply demand question. Do you do, you do the chicken of, of supply, get that going first? Do you get demand going first? How do you begin to, uh, to get that flywheel spinning? And also, I'd love to hear about sort of idiosyncrasies and things you've learned as you got your businesses off the ground. I guess we'll start on, uh, we'll start on this side, and then we'll go down uh, the long way. Cool. So we're a little different than the standard marketplace like, uh, like these guys over here. But uh, we still have that chicken and egg problem. And my founder and I were the first two drivers for Washio. And so um, even when we, we just launched Chicago uh, yesterday, actually. And so we have that same problem where we need to find enough drivers, but we need to have enough customers uh, to service those drivers and vice versa. And um, it's definitely an issue. And you know, predicting kind of how many people we need and like trying to optimize the net revenue for your contractors and any of these businesses, I think, is very important for us and probably for these guys, too. So um, it's really about kind of scaling to the sa same size as your growth and kind of trying to follow that line. Um, I would say for us, it was not only about just starting local, but actually very um, micro local. So finding very qualified sitters that could work in um, a submarket of San Francisco and making sure that they were vetted by us initially and getting that really qualified supply side in and then working with parent organizations in that same market to get the parents in. And once we kind of curated both sides, then the true marketplace kind of took over and, and we've kind of followed that model in the different markets that we've gone into. I think the, the quality of the experience in the beginning is the most important. So I personally called probably eight or 900 potential dog sitters. And if you have really great dog sitters in the beginning, or babysitters, or I guess in this case drivers, um, that leads to a better customer experience, which ultimately is what allows the, the momentum of the business to grow. If those first customers don't have a good experience, the whole thing doesn't matter at all. So you've got to find good people first, and it's going to be a manual process in the beginning. So you, you would, it sounds like each of you would say that the, the chicken is the, uh, is, the, is the supply. You have to have great supply, and if you're trying to get a marketplace off the ground, you have to sort of cultivate that and make sure that's in position before you take on any demand, if you will. Yeah, I mean, and the amount of supply de depends on a lot of different factors. I mean, if you, um, in babysitting, you might need to just focus on a certain area. In our business, we don't necessarily need a ton of supply to fulfill demand. So it really depends on the dynamic of the business, the amount of supply, the density of the, of the supply that you need before you can start driving some demand into it. But you don't want to wait too long, because if 
you have a lot of supply sitting around for six months, they lose interest and, and it's essentially not quality at that point. Lynn, what did you learn about getting that going with Urban Sitter in terms of was there times of the week, was there times of the day, were there certain geos, were there things that you felt after playing with it, this is the, this is the thing we have to do to be able to, to sort of get the seed off the ground, particularly in, the, say, in a new market? Yeah, for us, it's really all about having both connected parents and connected sitters when we get going because we leverage the social graph so heavily. So what we found was finding um, a, a college-age student who had a lot of experience babysitting and getting that person to become an advocate for us so that not only were we gaining additional supply, so to speak, but they were people that were um, motivated because their friend was already seeing success. And so having a highly connected supply side um, helped us grow that and, and keep a very motivated and sort of high-caliber supply side off the bat. Got it. And Washio, what? Uh, how did you get your first? You got a good driver. Were there so things that you learned or things that you spotted that maybe were counterintuitive? You didn't guess that that sort of went into getting that first initial traction. Um, you know, like they said, obviously it's all about the experience, and especially in initiation of when we open a new city or when we're growing, that we really try to identify that user experience and try to find contractors that can kind of fulfill that role of representing our brand because they're really the face to face of our brand who are interacting with our customers and. You know, once you find this good core group at the beginning of any kind of market that we launch, then they become obviously the best referral method. So not only um, are they bringing you in referrals, but they're bringing you in qualified leads because not only do they want to make themselves look good for bringing you good people, but that person has already been educated on what the job is and what, what it entails. And so it really allows you to kind of have this um, exponential growth of kind of uh, supply side by, by bringing good people in the core and the base. So that's pretty fascinating. So basically, right there, Nugget achieved that to get one of these marketplaces going, you get your supply side, you nail those people, you, you, and they even become advocates for the service because they want it to be successful and they actually help you get, the, get that working. That's great. Okay, um, we're done. So the, uh, the, uh, the next question I have is in terms of brand and trust and credibility, uh, you're dealing with people's clothes, you're dealing with people's children, you're dealing with people's dogs, uh, all having different scales of, uh, of personal importance. Um, the, Which is the most. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Dep I, I'm sure it depends, case by case. The, uh, how do you, how, what things have you thought about? How did you, first off, build credibility and trust to even get the first order? And, and, and what did you do to sort of uh, continually roll that out and develop uh, partnerships or other things where you could sort of draw on the energy and credibility of other organizations or just yourself, but how did you get that going? And I'll start maybe uh, down at the end. Sure. I mean, so we, we have developed our own sort of um, quality system and we've received over 100,000 applications to be hosted and have approved less than 20,000. Uh, we have the best insurance policy in the industry that covers the hosts, it covers the dogs, it covers all the animals in your care. We have 24-7 support. We've got our own training videos. So we've developed our own proprietary systems for managing quality and maintaining that and really standing behind the service 100%. Um, I think that is one route that you can take. And there are also ways to use more standardized approaches like a background check, which in my opinion is of questionable value in a lot of cases. Um, and then there's, you know, through Facebook Connect and a lot of other ways that are more standard. And I think every business needs to find its mix of those things of off the shelf, automated and high touch solutions and customized solutions, depending on the nature of the business. Cool. Yeah, I would agree. And kind of tying it back to the last question, one of the things we do when we first launch in a market is we'll actually pay for um, our top sitters in that market when we get going to take CPR classes and they get certified with a badge that we recognize on our site because we know they've taken the class. Um, we'll actually um, have those sitters meet with somebody who's already um, kind of been like a brand ambassador for us so they understand how the program works. So we'll invest money early on in a market to make sure that we're getting the high quality in the door. And then um, once our system in a market is up and running, once the platform is working, we use um, the sitter's reputation to also drive trust. So not only will a sitter have 15 five-star reviews on our site, but you'll see that they have 10 repeat families. And that repeat user badge, I think it's something that um, in marketplaces, especially probably both Aaron's and mine, um, when you keep the transaction on the platform, you're able to surface some really important data to give the user both subjective and objective data to make their decision. Um, for us, we found that adding two-minute sitter videos has really helped. Um, it gives parents a good feel. And, and likewise, on the other side, imagine you're a sitter and you're going to someone's house for the first time. That can be a little bit overwhelming, too. And so we show the sitter, hey, this parent has booked X number of times on Urban Sitter and six sitters have come back again. Or, hey, your friend uh, Nicole babysat for that family. So you might not know them, but one of your friends has been there before. So we, we take into consideration on both sides. 
Got it. And, and you also uh, partnered with organizations to develop both distribution and credibility, is that right? Yeah, we partner closely with top parents groups in the markets that we're in. So um, here in LA, we might partner with Pump Station, or in San Francisco, it might be Golden Gate Mothers Group. But we actually kind of borrow trust, so to speak. We'll, we'll partner with groups that have already gained parent trust. And by doing that, um, and giving the people that are members of those groups the, uh, the kind of the security of mind that somebody else from that group has used one of our sitters or that our sitter has taken a, a child first aid class at that facility. Um, we're essentially kind of borrowing trust until our brand trust um, takes over. Got it. Yeah, so we do a lot um, just on qualifying uh, our drivers, our ninjas as we call them, um, from what Aaron said, from background checks to video interviews to video training and a whole slew of other things. And as well, at the same time, we have an entire quality control department that's inspecting our facilities on a daily basis. We go through all of our customer stuff multiple times, uh, multiple checkpoints and failure points to make sure that you know nothing goes wrong. And of course, with all of us, you know, accidents happen, bad things happen, and it's really about um, how you manage that crisis and kind of how you take care of the customer because you go from you know maybe losing someone's clothes or damaging something or you know I don't know I can't even imagine some of the things that could happen to my right. So um, you know, and it's really about how you deal with that situation and and being able to build that trust with that customer. And I think if if you can conquer that solution, then you can really build a, a strong brand. Okay. Like, as Jordan said, nothing's ever perfect. But as a company, if you own, if you own uh, and support your customers, that'll, that'll ultimately make the big difference and, and ends up being what is the growth engine behind your business, taking care of your customers and going forward. And I just want to add, like we're all early here too. I mean, we're talking as, but these are businesses where we're all still hustling and trying to get these marketplaces to grow bigger and, and to get more and more market share. This doesn't end and we're constantly working to, to build trust and to, to get more suppliers and to get more customers. So it's an ongoing journey and, and we're always constantly iterating because there's no easy answers. Here. That, no, that's, that's, this is the pulpy, crunchy center of the question <laughs> that we're trying to get to at Vader Splash. All right, so one of the challenges of marketplaces, and, and you know, I think uh, we're all guilty of this at times, is sort of the, the reverse showrooming. You use the marketplace, you find a supplier, you you then kind of maybe go offline with that person. You don't necessarily go back to the platform, um, or other chances where you just use it once. One of the things that, that that we've seen marketplaces do is start to add on other services, reduce friction, make it easier, add value-added stuff, do things in addition to the transactions. The transaction sort of just the the, the baseline, but you. You handle payment, you handle tipping, you handle all the things. Like I, the reason I use Uber is I hate figuring out what the appropriate tip is on a on a you know nice car ride. Like it's just you know now it's a big emotional decision. So just the tipper, the, the tip is great. Adding twenty percent is really hard, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't want to do it. You know, so uh, it's done. I don't have to worry about it. So the so so I would say to you guys, what are the things? First off, is that a concern? And secondarily, regards to the concern or not, what are the things that go around the transaction? That you think you can help uh, help the consumer with? I'll start on this end. Yeah, so we, you know, our marketplace obviously is a little bit different than theirs, and so it's very difficult for our consumers to kind of go offline. We we try to be, you know, like the full stack startup. So we're trying to provide, you know, all the services to the consumer. So there is no alternative or, or going somewhere else. And I think at the end of the day, if you can provide happiness, which is what we're like all trying to strive for. Um, then the consumer won't even think twice about about leaving your platform. So it's really about like satisfying both sides of the marketplace, so like everybody can turn out happy. And if you can focus on creating that happiness and that and that amazing magical feeling that you get with Uber or with Dog Vacay or um, I don't have any children, but Urban Sitter I'm sure is magical as well. Um, you know, then you can you can really sustain. Some of our sitters date. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married. <laughs> And my wife takes care of dogs on dog vacay. And, and I'm a user of both. We use Urban Center. I'm watching you. Just for some plugs here. <laughs> so, Liv, what things are you adding on, layering on? Is it a concern? What are the things? Yeah, I mean, it was a huge concern for us initially. And we always said, if we can make um, booking a sitter through Urban Sitter better than texting, then that would be part of the battle on the parent side. And I think on the sitter side, it's actually an easier solution for them because um, as a sitter, getting multiple calls from parents and looking at your calendar, it, it's always kind of a hassle. And so for sitters, allowing you to maximize the time that you want to work um, by having your availability on our system. Um, I think for the sitters, it was a lot easier. On the parent side, um, the payment, being able to pay your sitter without going through your wallet and finding cash. I think um, our average response time in markets like LA and San Francisco and New York is about 32 seconds. So for me to reach out to 
to multiple sitters um, at the same time and, and get a response, I can take that off my to-do list. And it's kind of like open table. Even if I know I want to eat at Jelena in Venice, I'm still going to book it on open table. So if it's not available, I know what my other options are. And um, we've actually had a really high repeat use rate, but we're constantly chipping away at like, how can we reduce the friction? What other experiences can we add that are value added to the parent to do it through the system? Got it. People from San Francisco come down and make multiple restaurant reservations and then only use one of them, huh? That's right. <laughs> Uh, Urban Sitter has done a fantastic job of this, of, of managing the, like, reducing the friction, as you said. It's something that we're working on at Dog Bay Um But, you know, there are other ways to add value, too, and I think that's through uh, a service like ours, which is really around travel occasions, is less frequent usage, and it's more about finding that perfect match. And what we do is we help you find someone who's a perfect fit for your animal, who's equivalent to your child in many cases, although I have human babies now, too, so that it's a tough, <laughs> tough fight. But um, anything you can do, you, you create that trust and you support that experience from beginning to end with customer care, with responsiveness, with insurance, with all those things. That's, that's how you do it. Um, but reducing the friction is an absolutely essential part of it. Because anything that's easier to do, you will do that by default, even if it in some cases costs a little bit more money. In terms of, uh, first off, how much time, uh, the little clock thing isn't running. Oh, we're good? Okay, so just let me know. Give me a five or a ten, yeah. Um, I got one minute? All right. <laughs> I thought I had like 30 minutes. Uh, the, uh, okay. The, um, all right. So then we got uh, my last question for each of you is if you're going to abstract your company uh, and say take a step back beyond the thing it is right now, but sort of the, 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 sort of the, the thing you could be down the line. You know, Jessica Alba and, and Brian said that, uh, that they want to be not just sort of you know, diapers by subscription, they want to be a CPG company of the future and be a major you know, institution along those lines. I'd go down the line to say, what, you know, what's the abstraction that, that maybe these other services, that, that, that sort of the umbrella that this fits in, the context? So start with Washio. So Washio plans to be the nation, if not the world's largest dry clean and laundry provider. There's over 40,000 dry cleaners across the country, another 35,000 laundromats. We really believe by uh, disrupting the distribution model and bringing the product uh, directly to consumers' homes that there won't be the need for all these retail locations and, and we can be the end all supplier for that. I would say for us, it's all of the trusted services that you can think about that a parent needs to find for their child from um, a, a nanny or a babysitter up through um, probably getting into things like tutoring and another. Um, we have a lot of people that book college athletes on our site because they want somebody who can go and play soccer with their child for an hour. Um, so it's all the things you can imagine from age six months up to probably 12 years old. Got it. Stay away from pets, that's all. Um, yeah. A lot of our, <laughs> yeah, no. our But a lot of times our families want to travel without their pet. I actually think that's yeah. a yeah. Joint venture. <laughs> could be a merger, could be a merger. Uh, uh, we think of Dog Bay K as actually a pet wellness company that as the pet care provider, we're learning information about your pet's health, your pet's activity, your pet's behavior, and can be in the conversation about how to take care of them from beginning to end, full suite of products and services. So starting with something simple like boarding, but it is a much larger, larger vision. So I think, I think the lesson here, because I'm out of time, apparently, uh, the, the lesson is great entrepreneurs like these guys can not only say what their business does, but can articulate the grander vision like that on a dime without it, no prep. And I think that that, for people here, if you're going to grab uh, uh, one of the Javelin guys or whatever in the elevator and give them your pitch, uh, make sure that uh, you've got both what you do and the bigger context in which it sits, because that's, that's the story. That's, that's the venture fundable uh, narrative. So with that. Great entrepreneurs, thank you for all three coming up. And, uh, and we, uh, I guess I'm turning over, so we're out of time. So thank